hi there once again this is chat of athletes and we're back again with another episode and he's a bit different the aura is a bit different everything's a bit different um before starting this episode i think i wanted to get into a bit of a, a monologue um i have a couple of stuff to get off my chest um and well more more of a dialogue dialogue with the camera and whatever audience stands behind it on the other side of the internet and it's a thing of <clears throat> i've tried to understand what's the purpose of this whole project what's my intention what's my way forward what is the end goal of it all all right and it's okay to have an audience that views my videos on a consistent basis and able to attain some sort of financial remuneration from it and establish a platform of which not only i personally gain but it opens doors for several others of which i hope to get into business with right that's one leg of it okay cool then how do i go about doing that specifically with this show and it's to create a good product besides creating a good product it's providing a consistent product of which not only for consumption makes sense but for popularity sakes is appealing to a majority but not in the sense of i'm solely attempting to appeal to a majority for a particular period but have a consistent growth or consistent path that's carved through this body of work and it's only episode two and i'm well aware of the deficiencies that the show currently possesses all the way from um time the time it's posted the production process and over the overall quality of it all the visual quality that is and to an extent the sound quality of it and so this is more or less these i'm, I'm kind of trying to take you through my my daily thoughts and I'm thinking to myself, how can I make it better? How can I make it more? How can I pull how can I pull more out of the little that I have? And I'm 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 kind of coming up with those ideas, but one of them is short being more comprehensive and concise at the same time with the information that I share. And it's also understanding what's my what role or position do I play in all of this in terms of what purpose do I serve? You know, am I trying to tell a particular message? Am I trying to be entertaining? Am I trying to be controversial? What is it that I'm trying to, how do I go about achieving this particular goal that I want? And my desire is not to be a figure of authority. My desire is, but inadvertently so, I understand that if this does gain popularity, I do sort of become a pseudo authority in a sense in terms of, my opinions will then influence several others to view some a particular thing a certain way so that's the one side of it but then the other side of it is i though it's though it may, it may not be my intention i understand that might be an inadvertent outcome an inadvertent outcome of the whole thing right and it's really a thing of I have to build confidence in how I speak. I have to build confidence in how I engage with the camera and how I engage with the mic. And I have to be myself. And it's very difficult to be yourself trying not to be someone else or trying and, and trying not to follow what another person is doing. So I think it's a journey of which I'm trying to get onto. It's, it's a journey of which I'm very much, as on a daily basis, I'm growing in confidence but I believe in my potential capabilities and where I could end up with this whole thing. With that being said, okay, man, let's get into the games. Let's get into the games. F the English. Um, F the Model C English. Now we get back to how I like to talk. Okay, actually, I'm going to keep on talking like I talk because that's how I actually talk. So I'm going to start with the basketball on this time. You know, starting with the basic. <laughs> ones and twos and we're gonna keep it simple we're gonna keep it very i'm gonna be very concise i'm gonna look at the timer every, every time you see me look at my phone just know i'm looking at a timer on my phone right and okay I'm, I'm closing up on five minutes um so i've done the time that i need to do and i'll be doing the introduction in two one and welcome 
Welcome to Chat of Athletes, baby. We're back again. It's the second episode. We're coming with a lot more energy, a lot more intensity, and a lot more facts and personal, personally biased opinions on sports. And I am once again, Koketo, aka Hancho Jack. Yes, sir. The one and only, the big man, the one with the authority, the one with the knowledge, the one with the insight on sports and, and the game as a whole. I'm here, I am your vehicle that drives you, that drives you through this journey and I will continue to drive you from start to finish and I will never, I will never forsake you. Now let's get into it, starting with basketball, we're keeping it simple, keeping it light. We're going to, to LA, this is, this is going to be heavily based LA, LA coverage this episode, right, for two reasons, both sides of LA obviously. From the Clippers to the Lakers. We start off with the Clippers because they made headlines recently. Um, this show is being recorded on the eighth of uh, November, right? This trade happened sometime I think last week, Thursday or Friday. All I know, all I know is that when the Clippers played the Lakers, James Harden was sitting on the Clippers bench. So it happened on about late Thursday. I think I found out about it late Thursday or late Wednesday. Um. So, the Clippers. The Clippers traded for James Harden from the Philadelphia 76ers. I'm a massive, Jim, I'm a massive, massive, massive James Harden fan. All day from his Houston Rockets days and his battles against Golden State. Um, and I'm a big fan of him as, as the personality. He's a very weird, funny dude in a way. So, I, I personally enjoy his style of basketball. But let's get to the important stuff. Of this. So, he got traded to the Clippers. Um he got traded for so here's what his trade package looks like, right? Um so the LA Clippers sent Marcus Morris Marcus Morris, one of the Morris brothers, Marcus Morris Senior actually, uh Robert Covington, Nicholas Batum and Kenan Martin Jr. in a twenty twenty four second round pick and a twenty twenty six pick from OKC and a twenty twenty eight first round pick from LA Clip from the Clippers and the twenty twenty nine, damn, and the twenty twenty nine first round pick swap from LA and the twenty twenty nine second round pick from the Clippers, um, so a lot, whole lot of picks. So that's a pretty decent package that really got to be honest. Um, but yeah, and then that package was packed, put together, and then it was sent to the Philadelphia seventy sixes and Daryl Morey for James Harden. Um and in return obviously they got James Harden and PJ Tucker. Um initially as rumors it was suspected that Terrence Mann is going to be a part of the package or was expected to be a huge part of the deal because he was believed to be a key figure in how the deal could go about and how the structure of it all happened. But someone you know, it's it's it, I'm like, okay, cool, fine. In, instead of Terrence Mann, you still keep on your better defensive players on the floor. Um and a future for the franchise, to be honest. I think he's a very good piece and staying, keeping him there is a very good idea. And I'm glad that it worked out for them. Um, And yeah, so basically the Clippers gave away their future without giving it all in its entirety in terms of players on the roster. But they gave away a lot of, a lot of their future picks, which is a bit like, eh. All right, and then you get in return PJ Tucker, who's a great defensive piece, a three and D guy who has played three and D almost his entire NBA career, if not his entire NBA career, all the way from Phoenix, then back from the Phoenix days to Houston, and then Philly, and then Milwaukee, you know, um, and then now in LA. So that was a good package, but I think I'd like to get into how this whole trade deal happened. So initially, James Harden opted into his player option 36 million dollar contract and he requested a trade so the news was this and i think i got this from espn a couple of months back it was that james harden opted into his player option under the agree under the 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 the, the impression that daryl morey will agree to him getting traded to the clippers and it seemed that there was a bit of a tug of war i don't know necessarily between the clippers and and philly or between daryl morey representing the Philly organization and James Harden, you know. But there was a bit of a tug, tug of war and it took a while for the deal to go through and once it went through, yay, he got his move. Now, the main reason why this trade is interesting to me 
is because the whole hype is behind the starting five, right? You have here's their starting five, and I'm assuming this is I didn't get to see the game they played against the Knicks. I saw they lost. I didn't see their starting five though, but I'm assuming this is how their starting five looked. It was Harden, Russell, PG, Kawhi, and Zubac, right? And that's a pretty good starting five. That's a solid starting five that offensively on paper could get you anywhere into the upper 120, 125 points per game margin. Um, they lost several key rotation pieces of which I think Kevin Garnett said this on all the, on KG certified. Um, he said that they lost a lot of the energy pieces and it's like, okay, you can lose energy pieces and you can still reap. You, you could be fine. You know, as long as the player that you're getting in return is, is able to cover up for those points. And I think in getting him is, it's good. That's a good pickup. Because if you look at his stats, they're pretty good. Counting from last season, obviously, because he hasn't played any game this season, he averaged twenty one a game, twenty one and ten. Um, he won the he was the assist assist leader for the season last year. Um, crazy how he didn't get an all star, but that's another conversation. So you see that he has the capabilities to really, really be a star man and really lead this team to crazy heights. But then you also look at. This was an issue that happened again when we played in Houston. It was that what happens between Russell and Harden because they're both ball dominant players. And PG kind of alluded to answering the question, sort of answered the question when he was on his podcast, Podcast P, and he said, Ty Lu said that once you all make it work, there has to be a certain amount of sacrifice to make it work. And once you all can do that as players, I can lead you to where you all want to go. That's what Ty Lu said. And I genuinely believe that. And I think. It's all down to how they make it work. Who gets the most touches? How does it work offensively? Harden is most is was expected to be the point guard coming into the team. So what does that happen to Russ? Do you shift Russ to a two? Do you shift Russ to a corner and three guy? What happens to Russ? Because there's gonna be an interchange between who brings up the ball between those two. But more, I assume fifty point one percent of the time, fifty one percent of the time, it's gonna be Harden. That's my personal assumption. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with it, but it looks like a very interesting team, right? Because before the trade happened, offensively, they were fourth in the league in offense, fifth in the league in defense. How does that trade impact that? Does it increase the offensive rating to like possibly a top three, top two offense? How much did it affect them defensively? Because they lost a lot of the energy guys that they lost to a defensive pieces but the key defensive pieces still remained in Kawhi, PG, Russ, Terrence Mann those are and pa- Dwight Powell to an extent but those are the defensive pieces of which are the most crucial and most important and contribute the most when 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 they're winning right but then you lose Batum you lose Morris it's just like how does that trade then play itself out in terms of going forward for the team don't know yet we look forward to that and it's really interesting but i really believe that the clippers have a lot of potential but i don't know the ceiling that it'll take i think basing it off of the msg game it'll be a bit tricky because they played well for three quarters stayed in the game and then they missed a couple of shots in the fourth quarter and that's why they lost the game to be honest granted the knicks are top four defense currently so if you're putting an offense that's not fully operative they're most probably not going to be able to survive against a crazy defensive team and a hustle team like the New York Knicks. So that's that, right? So, I, But I wish all the best, you know, for that this trade finally leads to them winning a potential championship or at the very least making a run to the finals, you know? And with that, we get into the second team. We go to the other side of LA. And I got beef with LA. I'm not going to pretend like I don't. I'm not a big fan of the LA Lakers. I don't like the LA Lakers. Um, I respect the LA Lakers in terms of the players that they have. Because to be a part of the top 400 players of basketball in the world, you have to be good at basketball, obviously. right? But I don't believe in the hype that they have because of the media narrative that's being pushed. Um... I don't think the Lakers are as good as they put to put to be. I was looking at their roster the other day and I'm like, eh, they have a good five. But 
they're they're the 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 people coming off the bench aren't the best pickups. Besides Gabe Vincent, I was like, I'm not really moved by this. So I'm gonna read out the names on their roster. They have Rui Hachimura, Max, they have Max Christie, they have A D, obviously, they have Jackson Hayes, I think it was a pickup from uh Pelicans. They have Jalen Shitino. Ooh. They have Damn, I can't even see my own handwriting. They have Lewis. I've Michael Lewis. Mikhail Lewis. I don't know what the F I wrote there. They got Prince. Tehran Prince. Um, they have Austin Reeves. They have Cam Reddish. They have D Lo. They have Vanderbilt. They have Gabe Vincent and Christian Wood. They are very good pickups. They are very good players that they have. But I don't think similar to how ineffective their second unit was when they played Denver. Or how, how how less of an imp- like I I don't think there's I don't think the off season pieces really move the needle as much as they think they do, right? I think there's two good pickups though. I think, uh, Gabe Vincent is a good pickup because he's a very 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 high level shooter. I think uh Taron Prince from I think he was playing for Mem- for the Timberwolves last season. He's a good pickup as well. But then I'm not a big fan of Christian Wood. There's a reason why Dallas let him go. He's a he's a definitely a twenty points per game big man. But his defensive lapsing his 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 defensive lapse has really been one of the reasons why they didn't bring him back in Dallas because he wasn't that great a defense, right? And granted, the Lakers were the best defensive team second half of the season when they made all the trades outside the trade their deadline. They were a great defensive team. Um but let's not play with ourselves here and pretend as though they are them, you know. They, you always have a chance when you have LeBron on the floor. But LeBron himself said this. He said, this is the uh, AD's team. I don't think a team can win a championship with Anthony Davis as its first star player. I stand on that and I raise my hand and I'm saying, if I'm wrong at the end of the season, I'll raise my hand and be like, hey, I fucked up. That's a bad prediction, yada, yada, yada. But I don't believe Anthony Davis is good enough to lead the Lakers to a championship. I believe he's best suited as sec- as a second place, as a as a, as a, as a, as a, A2, as a, as a 2A player, not as a 1A, or as a 1B player, not as a 1A. Why? Because there's this, I, I said this to myself about a week ago, and I said, there's really a difference between capabilities and potential Anthony Davis has MVP caliber potential but he has first team all NBA capabilities and what does that mean oh no no let me even restructure that a little bit and change that a little bit Anthony Davis has MVP level capabilities but not finals MVP capability but has final MVP potential potential means that the put the ceiling to your abilities right and his capabilities means what he can actually currently do at this moment and in time and i think where anthony davis is is he's maxed out right and for two it's a two-part thing it could be his fault in terms of he's he's not willing to put himself through that extra bit right and at the same time it's also a bit of circumstances the moment anthony davis gets rolling he gets injured comes back he gets injured right on the other side of it, he doesn't look like he can do it. I personally don't look at him and say he's a world beater. No. He shows glimpses of it. And he's never shown it on a consistent run. For me to say that, you know what? He's actually great. Anthony Davis had a great he averaged twenty and twelve or twenty five and twelve or twenty six and twelve in the playoffs against Denver, I think. When they ran to the to the conference finals. But he was never he didn't have that expected to him. He didn't have that to me, that ability to say that, give me the ball, get out of my way, I'm, I'll score. Granted, Jokic was such a dominant figure and all of that. I just think Anthony Davis reached his maximum and he couldn't do more, right? And that's not a bad thing. He's already won a championship, right? Granted, he'd love to win more with LeBron, but I don't see him being able to do that. I don't see that happening. I'm not discounting the fact that the LA has a good team. I just don't believe in Anthony Davis. That's it.
and I think they're pushing a narrative because the Lakers made a few trades. Rob Palenka and the team made a good, few good trades. And I'm like, oh, they had the best off. The Lakers had the best off season. The Lakers didn't have the best off season. Dallas had the best off season. I think I went. For, I I said this in the previous episode that there was a episode I did, but I had to scrap, and it was the teams I'm most looking forward to seeing, and the team I had most. I the most I experienced the most hype about was the Denver Knight was no it was the Dallas Mavericks because the Dallas had a crazy off season their pickups were so good they fit in so well into that roster that people aren't really speaking aren't really being like oh yeah 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 they're discounting what Dallas did in comparison to what the Lakers did and the Lakers is getting so much coverage and so much hype because they're at the epicenter of of Cal they're in Cali they're the biggest team in California they are the nation's team. In terms of the USA, if you had to speak of a basketball team, the number one team is going to be mentioned. It's the Lakers. Yeah, Lakers. Uh, Kobe, LeBron. You know, that's and it's all, it's all, and it's all, it's all bonkers. It's all bonkers. I'm not buying into that, and that's why I don't believe that they can do it. I don't even think they can. I think they can make it to the conference finals. I, I there's two teams that I can't see them beat in the seven game series. I can't see them beat Denver, and I'm finding it very difficult to see them beat the Warriors. Right, and to an extent, I think they can match up. I think it could be a close seven games with a Dallas and with a Phoenix. I think they can beat the Phoenix in six, though. But we'll see how this. I don't. I think the team is good enough. I don't even think that they're good enough to beat the Clippers in a seven game series. The Lakers are good, but aren't really. The Lakers were in a good position last season because they got strong when the West got weak. And Denver was the only team that was strong. And Denver said to them, well, you can't beat us. You actually can't beat us because we're better than you, we're stronger than you, we're bigger than you, we're faster than you, we have a better offense, and uh, probably a better, you all have a better defense, but we're still better than you. You know, So that's why, for me, I'm not buying also Lakers ball. The Lakers are ass. And they're three at home and... and the three and zero at home and zero and three on the road. That on its own should ring a few alarm bells. Now they zero and four on the road because they lost the Heat. Um, close game, but they still lost. So it's one of those things of which I'm just like I'm not really. Also, I don't think D'Lo was a good enough player for a championship caliber or championship challenging team. I think he's a good offensive piece. I just don't think he's good. He's a good enough offensive piece to really have that much of a threat. And it's, for most part, it's part of his game. He's a mid-range player, and the Lakers don't need a mid-range player right now. They need a quick, strong 3 and D guy. If they, like a Caruso, man. Caruso was a really major piece for the championship. So, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a fan, man. I'm not a fan of the Lakers. I don't believe in the Lakers. I never will. They'll have to do some crazy stuff to make me believe in them. Because they still need more. They look like they still need more. You can't have LeBron being 39 and tying or if not matching and beating your best player in terms of how he, in terms of his play. I don't see a difference between LeBron and Anthony Davis. And LeBron's level has gone down a tad bit. Let's be honest about that. So, hey man, I'm, I've, I've said what I said on the Lakers. Not a fan. Don't believe in it. Stay on that. If it seems as though I'm pushing a narrative, fine. Deal with it yourself. Now, there's another team I'd like to cover. And I've already mentioned them in passing. And it's the Philadelphia 76ers. They've had a very good start to the season. Um, As I'm recording this, they're playing the Milwaukee Bucks. No, the, the Boston Celtics next. Um, So that tends to be a very interesting game. And see how they match up against the best team. In the in in the league currently, but you could also say the best team in the East, um, but they got they got a few pickups, you know, but the off season pickups included Kelly Oubre, Patrick Beverly, and more Bamba, um, which are very good pickups, uh, and then obviously you have your trade pickups in KJ Covington and Batum, and uh, picks obviously feature picks. Now JJ Redick on. On old man, old man, and the three things with the the, the dunker spot. They were talking about: Do you package 
the picks that you've gotten from this trade and then you put them up with other players uh, so that you can go out for like a Zach Levine or an OG and an Obi rather than a Zach Levine or, or a Zach Levine or Pascal Siakam. And a lot of them said get a defense, a 3 and D piece because you don't want to one affected the offensive rhythm because Philly are like top four and top top five and top five in offense and top four in defense. They can improve their defensive rating if you get someone like an OG or uh, Alex Caruso, and it really doesn't impact much the fluidity of the of their offense because it's already really really well set. Um. So I I I I I'm 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 for that. I think Philly. There's, there was a question of capability. There was a question of continuity of the hard and left and how the team would be, you know, would they be irritated and shaken up? And Maxi really said, nah, I've played point before um, and I can do it again and I can do it on a consistent basis and I can average above 25 a game just given the opportunity. And he's done that. Tobias is playing pretty decently. Um, Kelly Uber looks like a very good and pick, very great pickup for them defensively and offensively, as a good two way player, and you also and he fits well into that culture, that Philly culture, that rough, ragged, aggressive, you know, if you're talking about type of style, and you have Patrick Beverly who's a dog who's gonna go out there and hound players and look for his man and make it tough on them, and well, Bamba's a very good pickup as a backup center, you know. They have, uh, as the current starting five, they have De'Anthony Melton, Maxi, Tobias Harris, Kelly Oubre, and Joel Embiid. And it's a very good starting five. Is it a championship winning starting five? No. I think thinks they, they still need more defensively or offensively. I think whichever way they choose to shift it, as long as Joel Embiid is a part of it, they really have a chance, right? You just need a little bit more to just tip you over the scale to get past the Celtics. Because the Celtics is... Celtics are a very good team. Though they lost to the Timberwolves, they're still a very flipping great team. So let's not disrespect them like that. Right? So it, 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 it's a very interesting point that they find themselves in. But I think with the coaching of Nick Nurse, I was very afraid to see the direction that the team is going to take. Um, I, was a, I wasn't a Philly fan. I was a Harden fan. So obviously, naturally, I'd love... The, the, the connection, the chemistry, they pick and roll game made sense. No, they both average over 20... You know, they were they were both twenty and ten people, you know. So it was a very great like it made sense. Um but I I, I was very scared seeing how the team is gonna look and how they would play. But they all my concerns somewhat have faded away. The offensive looks fluid, the defense looks very structured, and Embiid is playing like Embiid normally plays. It seems like Carden leaving Though it may have impacted it someone in terms of the defensive coverages he now gets, but it still doesn't really do much because he scored, I think, 48 like a couple of days ago. I forgot against which team. So it's like, eh. well, Embiid is still hitting over 40 a game. So it's like, come on, guys, what are you doing here? And I think it's going to take a while for Maxi to really get to that high level. He might win most improved player this year because of having see how his numbers have just gone up because obviously it's opportunity. His usage rate has also gone up. So that's good. And then there's the conversation of Maxi's not just gonna start getting different coverages. Forty games in. Thirty to forty games in it's gonna start getting different coverages. How does he handle that? How does Philly get over that hump? Will they then have had an additional offensive piece that helps them readjust themselves and realign themselves in a different way to push for a championship or or will they just stick to what, what they have and because they believe they have a good enough team we will see but i really hope that it works out for philly in the best way possible because it, it would be lovely to see them in an nba finals it would be very much an, an uh, uh, a good one a very good one and i i actually no nah, no nah, let me say it but i'd love to see philly in the final in the finals um now we're doing a part. I've spoken about three teams. Now I have two players to focus on. I want to get through them in like a minute and 30 seconds each. Luca. Luca's the number one player I want to talk about. Though I think Steph won player of the week in the Western Conference. But I think Luca started off the season very hot. Started the season very well. He's third in the league in scoring. 
And he's fourth in the league in assists. And he's third in the league in three-point makes. Right? So, he averages 31.6 a game and almost nine assists a game. That's crazy. His usage rate, obviously, is one of the highest in the league, if not the highest. So, that's not really anything to think or care much about but he really has a significant influence on how Dallas plays and he controls so much of the game and how well he's been able to do it it's very incredible it's beautiful it's his two-man game with Derek Lively it's coming very well it looks very good in terms of how he, he how they meet each other I think it was against uh yeah, yeah it was against the Nuggets where he hit they hit the two man game, uh lively rolled he threw up a lob dunked it I was like there's a lot more to come from that from that pick and roll play, and I think Mark Cuban and and the team as a whole really did a good job in terms of surrounding him with the necessary pieces to put him in a position to win. They understand Luca's a generational player we want to keep him here, and we need to try as fast as possible to start seeing what a championship winner for him looks like. What more do we need to add? What pieces do we need to remove? And how much more fluid do we need to make our offense to be for him to get to to really maximize his not only potential but his capabilities and to ha- have him show us what Luca looks like, right? I don't think they've done a good job. I think they've done a phenomenal job in terms of the pieces. And I think Jason Kidd as the head coach has done a good job in terms of the offense and the defense and how they play. And it's inc- it's impressive. It's incredible. It's respectable. I think Dallas had the best off season. I'm a big fan of Luca. I'm a big fan of Kyrie, and I love to see where their team could go. But Luca, for me, is just a cold man, just a cold white boy with ice in his veins and a game to respect. Some of the shots he hits are insane. Some of the dimes he picks out are insane, and he's he's he just looks good, man. And I really like Luca. I'm a big fan of him, and I hope that I think they're gonna finish second in the West. Third will be Golden State. Yeah, fourth will be the Lakers. Um, yeah, that's that. First, obviously, will be the Denver Nuggets. Um, but then onto the other player who has been most impressive for me, and it has to be my man Anthony Edwards. I love Anthony Edwards. I. The hype behind them started obviously at the summer Olymp- at the at the at the FIBA championships championship games. Obviously, they lost in the semis. They lost the third place game as well. But we can't deny how good Anthony Edwards looked in that entire run for the, for Team USA. I think it was the preliminary game when they played against Germany, and he was cooking them. Obviously, when it came to the championship game, he had a good game as well, but they still lost, man, which is a bit sad to see. But he came into the NBA season looking fit, looking healthy, looking very scary. He's looking like a good mother flipping player. And he's averaging 28.2 a game, shooting 52% field goal percentage, 47.2 from three, and averaging almost one steal a game. And his plus minus is plus 11.3, plus 11, plus 11. Plus 11.3. And his career, okay, his career average for steals this one was one point three. Average one point three steals a game, over his career, over the span of his career. He's had like, I think it's a four year NBA career now. And he, Anthony Edwards has MVP caliber potential, and he has MVP caliber confidence, but he has a killer's ability in terms of the way he scores, how he scores, the variety of how he scores, and how good he is at just focusing and harnessing his. His, his 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 abilities on a consistent basis he looks like he channels everything so well that it's crazy scary to see for a player only in his fourth year to be able to do this i don't think maybe he can sustain this he can sustain it for an 82 game season but a good 50 55 games he will definitely be killing it he i think his attempt is trying to secure an a uh, a uh, a postseason for himself and the and the Timberwolves this season because he looks like he just wants to play in the playoff and have a good playoff run and see how far he gets, you know, with his boys. 
But they look nice, man. I love how Timbo, the Timbo was looking, how the team compliments him. And they, he just looks good, man. He looks like a very, he looks like a player with a very good foundation. I think that's it. His foundation for basketball is so good and is so sharp and is so concise and so well put together that he looks very scary in terms of how far he can go and how well he's playing currently and how much of a pivotal piece he is wherever he plays, whether it's for the USA team or it's for, for the Timberwolves. He just looks like he just... He, I saw his numbers. His 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 points per game average has just been going up since his rookie year, and it's like, how good can you get? Do I think he can reach Jordan levels? I doubt it. I think the skill level of the league is way higher than it was during Jordan's era. But do I think in terms of his own personal game? I think he's physically he's, he's more closer to a Kobe in terms of how he looks and how he plays, but definitely Jordan esque. He 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 gives off almost that I'm the best player in the league aura, and two years from now, I'm gonna be wearing a Timberwolves jersey with Ant Man's five on the back, and I'm gonna be in Minnesota watching his game, and I'm gonna be waving that, waving that thing, in the stadium, you know, in that arena, and I'm gonna be dapping him up, and I'm gonna be saying I spoke about you a couple of years ago, and you you doing it, and I respect you for doing that, and I guess. Like, okay, this is just two things I just like to mention. I just found this very interesting. His field goal his field goal attempts from two is seventy point seventy point seventy point seven from two, right? Field goal attempts. But his points from two, which means his field goal conversion rate percentage, is fifty five point six. He's shooting over fifty five percent from the mid range. That's incredible. I don't think obviously it's sustainable for a whole season. But if it is, it probably matches, if not doesn't beat KD's mid-range percentage, who's technically on a percentage level high, the better, the be, the best and the greatest mid-range shooter. Because KD shoots for his shot for a season, I think his Brooklyn year, he shot 55.4. So it's really just like nothing but love, respect and admiration for these guys. And that's my piece from the NBA. I hope you all enjoy that part. And now we move on to football, man. We move on to Itiski. We come local to South Africa. And I'm going to pause this for a second because I need to find my papers. Because I can't find my soccer papers. Now on the disc side of things. So I don't want to pause the last one. I said I'm going to fetch my papers. I didn't fetch my papers. I'm not going to go look for my papers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to waffle through this one. Because I know the games of her heart. But the, the, the reason why I have papers with me is because of the stats. The numbers. They're very important to me. Um, but I think football isn't much of a numbers game as much as the NBA is. So I think I can just speak on it. I'm just going to speak through these games very quickly. I'm not going to waste anyone's time. The football games were horrendous this weekend. Obviously, to me, they were horrendous because Arsenal lost. But the games are pretty decent, I'm not going to lie. They were very entertaining. So we'll start off in South Africa. Yo, guys. Aish. I know it's not... It's for, that, for Chiefs and Pirates, it's not looking good, man. It's looking tricky. Um, Pirates, I think the previous weekend, they lost... They beat Cape Town. No, they lost to Cape Town Spurs, I think. And then... No, they won. I'm not sure. I think they lost to Cape Town Spurs, and then they played Richards Bay over the weekend in the Carling Knockout Cup. Lost five four in penalties. Um, Hardtoe missed his penalty. He was the first penalty kicker, and he missed his penalty. So that that was a bit like uh, iffy. So Pirates have been in a really tricky run of form. I think they're lower on the table than Kaiser Chiefs, but they. And down the lower ends of the table, they've really struggled to find a momentum. Though they've won the the MTN eight, but they're really struggling to find momentum and really pull wins together to get themselves up there in the lock. I think there was a bit of an expectation that Pirates might finish in the top three this season. I don't think they can. I see them finishing top six, but I don't see them finishing higher than fourth. I'm not gonna lie, because I just think 
there's something missing in that team, right? If it's not injuries or suspension, there's something not clicking fluidly for Pirates. And I don't watch their games. I'm not a Pirates fan. So I'm not going to watch a Pirates game. I haven't even watched one this season besides the MTN, MTN 8 final. And they looked decent in that game for patches, though, you know. But I'll attribute that result, the, how their performance in that game to the weather conditions more than anything else. So it was a very, like, guy, like, it was a... I, and then I think they'd lost to Skukune as well. In... Was it was it, was it the Talcom? I'm not sure, but there was a game they lost to Skukune uh, on penalties as well. So it's like, oh no 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 no, that was Sundowns. Sundowns, and in, in, in the in, in the quarterfinals, Sundowns lost to Skukune on penalties. My bad, my bad. But yeah, man, Pirates look very shaky. Pirates look very tricky. I, I don't know, man. I don't, I just don't believe in Pirates, and I don't have to. But like, I wouldn't say my da. So I'm gonna shift from them, and I'm gonna go. Chiefs is playing today. Um, um, I don't think we're going to win. I think that game is going to end as a draw. I think we're playing Amazulu. I think that game is going to end as a draw. I don't believe in Ikosi. Yeah. And they're playing against Sun. <laughs> they're playing against Pirates in the derby. That game is going to end as a loss for us. I don't think... Yeah, man. We don't have a head coach. We look all over the place. We just We're just bad. I think it would be a good win and a good morale booster for the team, but I don't think they can do it. So I don't believe in Chiefs, unfortunately. So they're going to lose that one. And then they're playing up against... Now we're going to... Yeah, they're playing again today. I don't think they're going to win. Like, it's, I, I think Chiefs are going to suffer back-to-back defeats, basically, in the league. And it's sad, but it's the truth and the reality of it in terms of they don't have a coach. They looked very confused or incapable of getting a consistent round of wins over uh, at the start of the season there were patches of good patterns of play under the previous coach but there really wasn't much there to applaud in terms of there were good patterns of play but there's a lack of goal scoring in terms of there's there's no finishing achieves i'm not gonna lie the the best we have is set pieces because we have height. But beyond in open play, I don't think Chiefs are good enough to threaten a team, especially a top six team, like a team like, like for example, how we lost against the Arrows. I don't think we're good enough to threaten those sort of teams offensively because we don't really have much to stand on. We can't score to help our lives or save ourselves. So, yeah, I, I don't see Chiefs winning anytime soon, man. It's really looking bad for the, for the two teams. And... The third PSL game I wanted to talk about, uh, it was the one that was played yesterday. I enjoyed watching that. It was very entertaining. Beba Jalela in Natal, it was Lamontville Golden Arrows away to Mam Keys' team, Royal AM. And it was a good game. It was a very entertaining game. It was a very entertaining game. Personally, the team I enjoy watching the most this season is Golden Arrows. I've watched a couple of their games this season. I'm like, that's my, that's the games I'm going to continue watching because the football that they play and the intensity and how they press, uh, you know, on the pitch, it's, 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 it's enthralling. It's engaging and it keeps you locked in, into the game because anything could happen at any moment in their games, right? Either they score or they concede. They, but they came against the Royal AM. It was a very, I shame, they, nothing happened. Nothing was going for them. <laughs> I'm not going to lie and pretend as if they had anything going. They were struggling in that game. Royal came with a lot more intensity, came over with a lot more tenacity, and Royal, that's why they ended up winning the game. Though, yes, Golden Arrows did miss a penalty. They didn't look convincing any, at any point in the game, right? They couldn't pattern strings of play together when they could. Their final thought was very much disappointing. No one could get in the, at the end of it. If they could, they couldn't really threaten as much. You know, besides the penalty. And the penalty hit a player's hand. It wasn't as if someone tackled someone. So, it's like one of those chance of penalties that you get in the game if, you, if you're if you fortunate enough. So, <clears throat> it really puts it really puts things into perspective in terms of... And Golden Arrows going, coming into this game, they had lost 3-0 previously to Amazulu in the Carlin Lockout Cup. Right? 
and it's like they've had two back to back away fixtures and they've lost both away fixtures. So now we're in, we're in a point of I will, can't these guys win against my team as a Teguin? As a Teguin? Like, can't they beat my team as a Natal? Is it a thing there, Jay? No matter, or, or what is it? But it was a very. They came second best in every department in terms of tenacity, intense, uh, ten, tenacity and intensity, overall play and patterns of play, and I think even attempts. But no, 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 actually, I think they had more attempts. They, they did have more attempts in that game. But they really. They. They. The game on a balance of play position was pretty even, almost evenly split. I think it was 54-45, if I'm not mistaken, to Golden Arrow and Golden Arrow's his favor. But they couldn't really do much with it. So it it, it is what it is, basically. Um, I think, I don't know who they're playing over the weekend. I think they're playing, I forgot who they're playing over the weekend. But I don't see, I see them winning over the weekend. They're, Third, fourth in the fourth in the table, twenty points this, so far in the season. Their best ever start. I don't see why not why they can't continue and h- kick on from there. So I believe that they can do it. Um, and we'll see. We'll really see how the season develops for them and how it goes on from here. But they look like a very good team. They look like a team with that wants to play entertaining and thrilling football and gain results at the same time. And they're doing that. So. Shout out to Golden Arrows and shout shout out to Royal to Royal AM because I think they went into the game as underdogs. To be honest, I didn't really think they were gonna win it, and they kind of had made an upset. So that's a good, that's a good one for them. And I will move to England. I'm gonna brush over this game quickly. Don't wanna talk about it. Don't wanna entertain it. Arsenal played Newcastle. We lost one 0 It was an unfair decision. That was a foul. Um, we played a game of intensity. We were we dominated position in every other statistical figure. But in terms of intensity, Newcastle came with a fight and they were ready to fight. There was supposed to be a red card in their game. Multiple, if you ask me. That have its challenge, borderline, yellow card. But if it was a red, I wouldn't have fought. Bruno Gramares should have been sent off before the 16th minute or 17th minute of the game even hit. But he stayed onto the pitch. We're not going to get too much into that. Leo and Jay are still now. Um... We missed a couple of chances, though they weren't clear cut. You know, a lack of creativity and not having order guard. I don't think the thing is with this, it, it was a chat of not having creativity impacted us. I don't think having order guard would have made a difference anyway. Because I saw how he played against Chelsea, and it was a similar game in terms of it wasn't more about skill, it was more tenacity and intensity and aggression. And that's not order guard's game. Order guard is slick, fast paced football. Slip the ball into spaces and let him run. He's not. He doesn't have a body to stand up on. To be honest, he doesn't. Uh, so that's that's that on that. Now we get into another interesting game. Liverpool uh, came close to losing, but somehow miraculously saved it at the end to a Darren Nunes to a. To a uh, uh, Yo, and he said Daniel Suarez. Um, guy, boy, guys, the Colombian guy. How could I forget his name? Uh, it's not Dow Nunes, man. Dow Nunes is stuck in my head because he just missed so many chances. Uh, Luis Diaz, Luis Diaz. Um, I think his father, his father's kid has been kidnapped, and it it's shot. It, it it. We hope that his situation at home. I think I said in the previous episode that you know we wish him all the best and that everything goes off for him that they find his family. So, but it's very. It was a very flat game. Liverpool missed a lot of chances. Luton capitalized on they were they were very good defensively. They were well organized and they countered on a chance and they scored. And there's really not much else to it. Uh, Liverpool missed too many chances. Uh, Salah didn't have his best of games. Nunes missed two decent chances. The tap in at the back post, horrendous finish. Um, but as a player, I believe in him. I believe in Darwin. I think Darwin is going to score 15, 16 goals this season. And not because of his brilliant finishing, but because Liverpool generally offensively create a lot of chances and they put players in good positions. You know, it's just unfortunate that he couldn't finish them. But, you know, I, I, I really think that they're going to, do well. City played as well. 6-1. Doku masterclass. Not much else to say about that. Because I want to get into Chelsea and Tottenham. 
as you know, I'm an Arsenal fan, so I hate both teams. But I went to this game needing, I don't think you get this, I needed Tottenham to lose, right? And the Lord, the mighty Lord we serve was working over time. Because ain't no way Romero gets sent off, Yudogi gets sent off, Van de Vent pulls up with an injury, Madison pulls up with an injury, and then you tell me that God isn't on my side. You can't tell me that God is not on my side. How are you going to tell me that God is not on my side? Because there's no way. There's no way that all those things happen. And then you look at me and be like, nah, God is not on his side. Come on, my nigga. What are we doing here? Huh? What are we doing here? Because that game really... And the funny part is, I said this to my mom yesterday. It was... I didn't feel like watching the game. I didn't believe the game was going to be as entertaining because I think I thought it was going to be 2 0 for Spurs. Um, but something inside me said, okay, so you need to watch the game because you're going to do an analysis on it and it's better to work from having watched the game rather than highlights. And from the word go, that game had entertainment, intensity, and energy. And it gave me more than I could have asked for because all I just wanted was a 1 0 Chelsea win. But I expected a 2-0 Spurs win. And it gave me a 4-1 Chelsea win. 4-1 Tottenham loss. You know how happy I was? Because we, we lost our unbeaten streak over the weekend. Over a foul goal. And then Spurs got away with losing a game against Liverpool. Over a foul refereeing decision. You know, a VAR error. And then they got to Delhi Dally around and still win games. And I was like, how are they getting away with so much? And then Carmel was like... Karma, quote me on this one. I'm not going to beat this part out. Karma's a bitch. And if you don't fix your life and you fix yourself up, and if you get away with shit, it's going to come back and bite you on the motherfucking ass. And that's what happened to Spurs. That's what happened to Spurs. So, once a fun event went off, I was like, oh no, my season's good. I'm good now. Spurs are shit. I hate... I, see, the whole Spurs... The Spurs sat, stand apart. I'm not bleeping anything out. I'm keeping everything as is. Because I don't like that team. I don't like them people. I don't like that white side. That Northwest London team. Remember Pierce when you, when you say Northwest London? I don't like y'all. I was it? I was it? North, it was North, it was Northwest London. Yeah, it was Northwest London. I don't like the Mandem there. The Mandem from Spurs. From South London, bruv. Nah. I'm not with them people. So I'm glad that they lost. I'm glad that it it fell apart. It fell up. It, it was like a beautiful it was like a beautiful film, right? In terms of it was like a Martin Scorsese film. Whereby there's so much hype and build up and there's so many things coming in certain ways and different directions. And then it, the movie gets to a point of which you believe that this villain is gonna is, is gonna kill this person because like you're just like oh no, my personal favorite character is about to get killed by the villain, and the villain's entire world falls apart. And then he's just like, I, I I wanted it to happen, but I never thought it was gonna happen like this. You know, like everything around them just doesn't come back together anymore. You know, it's 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 like watching the Irishman, and then you see this guy kill people. You see. Robert De Niro killed people. And he's like, how is he getting away with murdering so many people? You know? Because there's a scene whereby his daughter gets... I don't know if it was harassed or assaulted, but some guy robbed him the wrong way. And his daughter's very young. Daughter came back into the house and was like, you know, this guy did this, did this. And then he said, he... And Robert was like, that guy? It's like, yeah. Robert went out, kill that man, left. And it's like... And, and and once his life started falling apart and then his he started going to prison and they started playing the fifth and then they got life sentences then they, all of his friends went to prison it was like the villains this so this created figure of evil the life is falling apart and there's nothing they can do about it it was beautiful loved every second of it loved every moment of it Jackson didn't deserve square hat trick though I'll, I'll admit that Chelsea missed so many chances and couldn't time, couldn't, couldn't. They failed to pull the ball, put the ball in behind, the back line so many times. And Spurs are playing a high line of seven people. And telling me you can't put five decent balls into the channels. Sterling got tired of running. 
at some point he started holding up the ball and slowing down play a little bit, you know. But as a whole, I think that game was it's crazy how Spurs needed to capit- capitulate to that level for Chelsea to have a chance. I think that speaks that doesn't speak it speaks two things, right? One, onto Ange Postacoglu's mentality in terms of if we're down to five, six people, I'm still gonna play the same way I play. And it speaks to that sort of double edged stubbornness might win you games and also might lose you games. And then on the other side it speaks to to Chelsea how far they are in terms of where they need to be. They're not where they'd like to be, but they're very far away from where they need to be. Because if it takes that many miraculous miracles to happen in a single game for you to beat a Spurs, you have a lot more to do in terms of your team, squad overall first eleven selection, and how you've sorted out your front three. Because I'm not gonna lie, man, Nicholas Jackson is a meaty striker. He 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 doesn't look convincing to me. He has all the physical attributes to be a very good, a decent striker, but he doesn't have that clinical edge or that look about him that screams, I'm a clinical finisher, you know. And I hope that it eventually changes. I don't think it will uh, because it's Chelsea. I don't like them. I, I'd never wish them well. Any any opinion London-based will forever be biased. So Spurs are ass. They'll be ass to me. I'll never see them as a team. Chelsea are ass. They will always be asked to me. I'll never see them as a team. West Ham, ass. I'll never see them as a team. Brentford, ass. I'll never see them as a team. Fulham, ass. I'll never see them as a team. All these London teams, I don't care about them. I won't. I don't respect them. I'll never see them as a team. My team is at the top of the food chain right now, and that's what I care about. I don't care about anybody else because I've been at the down, at the bottom, at the trenches for so flipping long. That niggas would, bro. I remember getting dissed for supporting Arsenal. This girl. Story time, people. So I'm on Instagram. And I'm and I'm and, and this one time I was back in Cape Town at the time. Um, so this girl, I start into her DMs, you know, we start chirping it up. I follow, she follows back. I'm like, ah, oh, nice, clean. Patting myself up, you know, with a with a young convo. And then this one day I think Arsenal was playing. I think it was playing Chelsea and we lost that game, actually. Um I don't think they were the Chelsea. I don't know. I think it was under the under the Frank Lampard era. Yes, and Ch- we're playing Chelsea, and I'm rocking my Arsenal T-shirt. I posted on my Instagram story. I'm hyped. I'm feeling myself. This girl is like, "You're you're an Arsenal fan." She laughed, dog, and I was like, "That memory, that that ex- that feeling, is etched into my heart and into my mind in terms of." I will never acknowledge another London team. I, I don't have... I used to have respect for every single fan base and every single team. I don't respect Chelsea fans. I don't respect Tottenham fans. Because they never respected me. You know? And it's like, why should I be civil when I'm at the top? I'm not going to be civil. Chelsea are bad. And they will be bad for two, three more seasons. Why? Because their squad selection is poor. Their purchasing options are poor. And the lack of offensive fluidity that they have is much more troublesome because not only do they have a lackluster front three, they have a lack of creativity behind it that's, that they, they, they will go through a lot of trial and errors to match and to find the right mix. Because they're just bad. They bought... I think there's, 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 there's a miss... There's, 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 there's been use of a bad word. They've been said the talent is raw. The talent is not raw. A lot of the front players that they bought are not good enough to be at a Chelsea. And the skill set that some of the decent players have isn't good enough to be an all-encompassing forward. Sterling is a good goal scorer, but Sterling isn't a great winger. And that's... They need a winger, not a good goal scorer. But because since you only have a good goal scorer in Sterling, Sterling, if you put him in front in front of goal, he'll finish it a lot of the time. But if, if you expect him to carry the ball a lot of the time, he's going to struggle because his body isn't... his. Style of play isn't used to that anymore. He left that system when he was still in Liverpool. So he still needs to relearn all those things again. And it's going to take a long time. By the time it takes them that, Chelsea would have moved away from him. Because even though they believe it's a project, at the end of the day, it's a game of results. And if a player or if a manager doesn't get results, you shift out of the team. So Chelsea is still going to suffer. Chelsea is still going to go into a whirlwind until they fix up their whole line of structure 
from the top all the way down to the pitch. But that's all for football. I'm a, I love my team. I'm, a, I'm Arsenal through and through. They're playing today in the Champions League. I'm wearing a PSG t-shirt. Yes, I used to support PSG before Messi got there. Don't come for me. I supported PSG when they still had Gattuso in the Monday, when they had Lavetti in midfield, the Argentinian winger. So don't come for me, please. Um, yeah, but I'm a football fan. I'm an Arsenal fan. I am a basketball fan. And I am Kogetsu. This has been Chat of Athletes, episode two. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. We really would like more subscriptions because we need more subscribers because I'm trying to get this to a thousand subscribers. So on a manifesting right now is subscribers and a couple of likes and a couple of views from you and your friends. But subscribe, subscribe, like, do enjoy. And I thank you for coming. I thank you for watching. I'm going to stop doing weird stuff now and I'm going to leave your face because I've been irritating. And goodbye.